A very warm welcome to all for joining us for our second installment in the interview series conducted by the College of Chemical Sciences, Institute of Chemistry, Ceylon. These interviews produced by the Media Circle of College of Chemical Sciences aim to highlight the incredible journey of prominent scientists having Sri Lankan roots in hope to inspire future pioneers in the field of chemistry. I'm Sachin De Silva, a fourth year student at College of Chemical Sciences. For this interview, we have with us a dynamic scientist all the way from Queen's University, Belfast in Northern Ireland. He's none other than Dr. Nimal Gunaratnam. Thank you very much, sir, for accepting our invitation and for being with us today. To start off, sir, could you tell us a little bit about your childhood, your schooling days, and your life at university? Okay, um, nothing too special. Um, I, I was born um, in a, a town called Vattala, which is about um, six miles away from Colombo, um, a village called Valiamuna. Um, and I mean, these days, you know, it's very much like part of Colombo. Um, the boundaries has extended. Um, the, so I went to a school um, in the local area. Um, it's, it's called St. Anthony's College Vattala which was run by Christian brothers. So I was brought up a Catholic. Um, so at that time, my parents were very keen to send me to a, a Catholic school. Having said that, it was a really, um, it's, it's not a very prominent school, but it had a mix of really nice things. So there were, there were Muslims, Tamils, Buddhists, um, people of all religions um, with different means, um, rich, poor. <laughs> um, uh, so it was a, a good experience in, in, in one sense. At the beginning, um, it was a private school. It started as a private school, so you have to pay for your education. And then it was taken over by by the government, so then it ran as a government school. Um, the teachers were de very dedicated, but we had very few teachers. For instance, in the A-level class, we had two teachers doing all the subjects. Um, uh, so there were people, uh, you know, there were only nine students in the, in the A-level class um, in the engineering stream. So out of nine, four of us went to university. So it was a reasonably good record for a small school. Um, the Christian brothers had a very, um, um, you know, strict, very strict um, um, uh, demeanor about them. So they basically ran the school uh, with the iron fist. So you, could, you couldn't do anything naughty and get away with it. Um, with the limited resources they had, they did a fantastic job. So I am one of the products. Um, so my mother, my father was uh, uh, electricians um, and my mother stayed at home and looked after us. And she was more than a housewife. So she basically ran the show. Uh, in the house, including money management, uh, and then also helping us with our studies. So she kind of drove us into achieving the highest possible. So that's my childhood. So I am, I am, uh, I have two brothers and and one sister. Um, all three of them are still living in Sri Lanka. So what about your university days? Like, did it help the you? The university days, it is probably, if I am brutally honest, I think that is probably the, the nicest period in my life. The, the time I spent at Colombo University, it was wonderful. Um, it also kind of um, evened out all the kind of... Um, 
uh, imbalances in your life. You know, you had um, you went for a small, you went to a small school, and then in the end, we all ended up in the the big school all together. So it was a sobering experience. A number of them had gone to uh, UK and and USA for their PhDs. And thankfully, I was very fortunate uh, in our fourth year, I think all of them returned. So there were a youthful injection of, you know, real enthusiasm and they talked about the research they did. And uh, there, I, I still remember there was a seminar um, Professor Tilakaratna, are you, are, are you familiar with that name? Professor Tilakaratna? Unfortunately not, sir. But... Okay. So all these people, um, they number of them went to Oxford and Cambridge. So Professor Tilakaratna went to Oxford. And there was another one called Professor Hetyarachi. He went to Cambridge. So they all came with long, wonderful ideas and uh, started doing research. So that was actually how the, the, um, the reason for my doing research. I think those younger people actually came back with so much enthusiasm uh, for research and explained to us uh, how to go about doing research. Right. Thank you very much, sir. Yeah. So and the then I returned. Sorry, I returned right. in 1985 as a lecturer to Colombo University and stayed there for two years uh, before returning back to Belfast. Right. Thank you very much, sir, for that. So for the next question, I hand over control to Ms. Onali Pasqua, a fourth year student at College of Chemical Sciences. Over to you, Onali. Thank you, Sachini. Uh, sir, listening about your early days and knowing about your passion, dedication, and contribution to chemistry through numerous publications and patents, it's truly inspiring. Uh, what drove you into becoming a dynamic research fellow in the field of chemistry? I could put down to one person, actually, the reason for me doing research. Um, there is a very prominent scientist called Professor A.P. De Silva. I, I don't know whether you know of him. Um, he was actually in the lab with me at that time. And he was always talking about the photochemistry he, he was doing with a um, few test tubes and a light bulb and so on. And then um, he used to go and tell everybody what he did, and then challenged us to find solutions to some of the observations he, he came across uh, in, in his chemistry. So he actually is single-handedly responsible in many ways. So he went to Belfast um, three years before me. And then we communicated those days, uh, we used um, uh, aerograms. I'm afraid the mobile phones were not uh, not available. <laughs> WhatsApp and things like that uh, never even thought of those days. So he wrote to me regularly explaining to me the kind of research he did. So he, he is the one who told one of the professors about me and then uh, eventually um, this professor wrote to me saying that he has a grant, whether I would like to come to Belfast and work with him. So that's how I, I came to Belfast. That was very insightful, sir. Uh, to ask the next question, I would like to invite Isira Radnaika, another four years, fourth year student at CCS. Isira. Thank you very much, Anali. So an innovation which Dr. Gunratna played a major role was the development of a unique perfume delivery system that is capable of releasing more aroma when it comes into contact with moisture. Uh, 
So this is one of the finest examples of recent breakthroughs at the Queen's University Ionic Liquid Laboratories Research Center. Dr. Gunaratna, would you like to elaborate more on this pro-fragrant material that you developed? Right, so if, if you buy one of the perfumes available in the market, so there is a solvent, and then there are many fragrance raw materials in it. Do you know how many um, fragrance raw materials are there in a very simple perfume? Have you have a guess? Uh, maybe around 20? Even more than that. There are tiny quantities. I mean, it could be 30. Um, very sophisticated ones would have a lot of materials, but some materials may be present in 0.01%. So like in music, so you have high notes, middle notes, and then bass notes. So in perfumes also, you have these, uh, these kind of materials. For instance, when you spray a perfume, the most volatile ones um, evaporates first. So your nose picks up, the, the sensors in your nose picks up. The a good perfumes, they evolve. So at the beginning you smell in a certain way because your top notes go away uh, and then comes the middle and then later comes the base notes. So problem is some of these um, really expensive, low volatile um, um, fragrances, they evaporate too quickly. So what we developed is a system where you, you with a bond, you tie these um, low boiling or low, um, um, very easily evaporatable, um, materials onto a, a, a ionic liquid, which is not volatile. So ionic liquids are not volatile. Um, if I want, if you want me to tell us a tiny little bit about ionic liquids, uh, if you take sodium chloride, okay, it's a, it's a solid. It's not a, it's not a liquid, but it's ionic. Okay, so you have a sodium ion, for each sodium ion, you have a chloride anion. If you want to make an ionic liquid with sodium chloride, you have to heat it to about 900 degrees to liquefy it, because sodium, sodium chloride has a very tight, tightly packed structure. So there's a thing called a lattice, and there's lattice energy associated with it. So, 900 degrees, I think a lot of organic compounds will decompose, burn away, okay? So what we have done is to lower this temperature using molecular design, lower this temperature to room temperature. So from 900 degrees, you lower the temp, you lower it to room temperature or below, and then it becomes a liquid at room temperature. So we make, so sodium chloride, you can't smell anything because it doesn't evaporate, okay? So if you tie anything to an, something that does not evaporate, so then it's held tightly. But then you, you should have a trigger to release it. There's no point having a fragrance tied to something, then you are not going to smell it. So on demand, you can actually release it with, with moisture, water. So we have a bond, the attached bond is vulnerable to water. So that was the perfume system we, we developed at Quill. So you can only at that, at that time, you can only tie um, the alcohol-based fragrances. For instance, you know, um, there are loads of um, fragrance raw material with the alcohol group. Um, so we did it with alcohol just to show the principle. 
Right, so that was very interesting. Uh, the way you bought down a liquid, uh, which is uh, having a very high melting point to room temperature, and then mm. uh, designed it in a way that it, the bond hydrolyzers, when it comes into contact with water, that's a really interesting approach to hear about. So 20 years ago, ionic liquids were a remote backquote in chemistry. So this began to change at the turn of the century, and the Queen's University Ionic Liquids Lab Laboratories Research Center was opened in Belfast, Northern Ireland in 1999. Since then, this institution has been a pioneer in generating groundbreaking research and even in patents. With that, sir, in your opinion, what do you think is the future of ionic liquids in aspects to the applicability and domestication of such a material? A um, lot of ionic materials, if you take table salt, okay? The simplest thing in your kitchen, it, it's a salt, so it's ionic. But there are a lot of, um, if you have a solid, then you want to dissolve it in something. You know, certain solids, depending on how, how well packed they are, it's very difficult to uh, dissolve certain things um, without using a lot of energy. Maybe you have to heat it or, uh, but if you take a liquid, um, it's easy to mix with, with another liquid um, or dilute it with another liquid. So um, you can just shake it, you know, you don't really have to use any heat or anything like that. So going from solid to a liquid, there are problems as well as um, advantages. So um, in in lot of products, if you have a liquid, it's easy to easy to incorporate into another matrix. Okay, um, you know things like bleach. Everything is is there are a lot of salts in it, but ionic liquid. So what I described are ionic solutions. So if you take some salt and dissolve it in water, it's not an ionic liquid. It's an ionic solution. So it's a, so in ionic liquids, there are no other solvents in it. So you have, it's made of entirely of ions, cation and anion. The future, so at the beginning, when my boss, Ken Seddon, who set up this institute, which is completely dedicated to, to ionic liquids, they only had one thing in their mind um, to replace volatile organic solvents with ionic liquids to do reactions. So if you want to do a reaction, you, you put um, your starting materials into ionic liquid and you heat it to whatever you know, temperature you want the reaction to undergo and then remove the products by distillation because ionic liquids don't distil. Okay, so that was the idea. But I think these um, this is a bit outdated idea. Um, now, because of the ionic nature, um, you can have these ionic liquids in mobile phone batteries, any other form of batteries. Um, in the old days, the the mobile phone batteries and batteries in laptops and so on contain an organic solvent. So if your laptop uh, gets overheated, okay, uh, the battery, the old batteries actually split open um, because it generates so much heat. And then because the organic solvent was so volatile, it just break open and catch fire. I think if you if you go to YouTube, you can actually um, see some clips of laptops, um, um, you know, um, burning because of overheating. I think that is one of the reasons. Also, um, in aeroplanes, when you are taking a laptop, there you have to make sure that there are certain precautions are, are taken. So. Ionic liquids, you can hold a Bunsen burner to many ionic liquids and they don't burn. Now, if you take something like ethanol or methanol or 
hexane and you hold a Bunsen burner, it will, um, um, you know, it will create a big flame. Um, so ionic liquids now, um, the future is going to be in materials. It also can be mixed with other materials, for instance, you know, like um, graphene or graphite and blend it and mold it into something which act like an electrode because there is, you increase the conduction because you have ions in it. Um, because it's a liquid, it's easy to incorporate into a, into a solid. You can grind them together with a binder. So a lot of these things now um, pointing towards um, materials or maybe, maybe making also composite materials with other things. So that's where that's where the future uh, lie in ionic liquids. That answer, sir. I believe the future of ionic liquids is very bright. So over to you, Onali, for the next question. Thank you, Sashini. Uh, sir, as a refreshing question, uh, this is related to your early career research involving uh, photosystems. Uh, X double dash, Y dash, uh, is it H systems as potential one, three dipoles. As a challenge, uh, could you explain your work on this area as if you are describing it to a typical high school student? Yes. Um, so um, my PhD work was on these one, three dipole uh, cycloadditions. Cyclo additions, um, they were um, discovered in 1928 by um, uh, two scientists called Deals and Old. So I'm, I'm sure you must have done this Deals Old cyclo addition. So it's a unique, unique reaction. So you have like a four carbon unit and a two carbon unit, and you put them together, and two new bonds are formed making a cycle. So these, I mean, now people take these kind of reactions for granted. Many pharmaceutical uh, molecules, drugs, and so on contain these six-membered rings. Um, and it has been used in the pharmaceutical industry, fine chemical industry to make uh, extremely sophisticated um, organic molecules. So it is one of the most unique reactions. So they want, so the, the, because of the uniqueness of this reaction, so you form two new carbon carbon bonds and make a ring in one go. Okay. And seemingly the two parts don't look like very reactive molecules. So one is a diene with two double bonds, and another one is a olefin, uh, just one double bond, and they 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 somehow react together. At that time, it must have been a big puzzle. I mean, we don't have they didn't have the same kind of techniques we have today, but these two scientists were able to figure out exactly how it happens. I mean, both bonds were formed at the same time um, and maintaining the, the, the stereochemistry um, uh, of the final molecule. Uh, there is a print uh, imprint of the stereochemistry of the diene maintained in the, in the final product. So they actually won the Nobel Prize in nine, 1950 for deals all the reactions. So it is, so it is a four carbon unit joining with a two carbon unit to form a six carbon ring, okay? My work, um, which was developed by my PhD supervisor called Rondri, um, he passed away last year. Um, he invented this reaction where you can incorporate the heteroatom into this uh, structure of the diene. Instead of a diene, he had a three atom segment combining with a two atom segment to form a five-membered ring. 
So in lot of drug molecules also this um, uh, heterocycles are present. So it has become um, actually a quite a neat way to make these five membered heterocycles to use these one, three dipolar cycle additions. Um, so it's kind of a cousin of Diels old. Um, it's a, it's a, uh, it has the same kind of rules and characteristics of the Diels old reaction, but you incorporate um, a heteroatom because there are a lot of heteroatoms like nitrogen, sulfur in, in drug molecules. So, so that's my early work. Okay, so thank you so much for that answer. Uh, it was well structured and I think anyone would have understood it the way you explained it. Thank you so much, sir. So, sir, my next question would be, so as a researcher, you are a well-known researcher, so what is your approach when initiating research with the ultimate goal of developing a product that could be commercialized? And in your opinion, what are the barriers that researchers face from taking research from benchtop to the market? When you talk about a product, um, the process is a very painful, long process. Depending on what the product is, um, for instance, if you, if you consider uh, a drug, okay, if the new product is a drug, yeah. it is the most difficult thing to commercialize. The, because you have to worry about, you have a lot of safety features um, you, have to, you have to overcome. The, you know, if somebody takes in like a pill, it goes into your body, you have to make sure that um, it doesn't do any harm to you, um, any side effects. So if you take any drug and with, with any drug these days, you have a little leaflet. And if you read this leaflet, okay, they will list out all possible um, side, side effects, okay? Um, it's impossible to avoid. Uh, different people react differently. So we, as human beings, we are very different. Um, so it, it, and if several people became ill after taking your newly developed drug, I mean, there will be court cases. I mean, you have to pay millions and millions of uh, pounds or dollars to, to the, the people who suffered. So, it is one of the most difficult and you need, um, that is why only few drug companies are making new drugs these days. You know, all these big giants like Pfizer, Novartis, I mean, these are billion pound companies, not million, billion pound. Um, for instance, Pfizer earn more than several billions because of their vaccine, okay? So this is within few months or just about a year, they earn over, over several billions. So there is a big risk um, if you want to develop a drug. If you want to develop a household product, there are less number of uh, restrictions on you, but still there are certain problems. So let's say you want to develop a cleaning product. Um, if the cleaning product um, comes into contact with your hands, okay, you know, let's say uh, washing liquid, yeah, it, you have to make sure that it does not do um, any skin irritation or accidentally, if something splash into your eye, um, uh, you have to make sure that it doesn't do um, um, uh, serious damage. So there are, depending on the product you want to develop, um, there are many, many aspects you have to be aware of and you have to be mindful of uh, because um, you have to think about the safety of the people who are going to use that product, okay? 
in some ways, I have a very different take on this um, um, re doing research to, to, to create a product. As university lecturers or teachers or professors, I think it is not a good idea to have uh, a goal. Okay, I'm going to make this product. What you need to do is to develop new chemistry. Somebody could take it and, and, um, and take it further. For instance, a lot of us in university, we are not trained, trained businessmen. If you want to in, introduce a new product into the market, you need to have people who are good at business. You need, you, they should know how to um, uh, promote the product. So that is not something the university lecturers or professors are trained to do. I, I think if you develop new chemistry, that is the important factor. If you develop a piece of new chemistry, okay? There, and if 10 people in the world look at your chemistry and say, oh, I can do something with, with your new reaction with your new uh, system, uh, I think that would be more appropriate. If you want to do business, and if you have a, um, a business acumen in you, I am not discouraging anybody to go into business, but then you have to dedicate most of your time, I would say more than 90% of your time to, to business, how to get this product into the market. You can't do too many things at the same time. So that is my opinion. Other people may have different opinions. I think as chemists, I think we should develop new science, new chemistry, new processes, new, um, um, maybe a new, new catalyst, which may do wonderful things. So I think that's our job. Uh, if you want to go into business, you have to dedicate a lot of time. Thank you so much, sir. So then moving on, sir, uh, a question which I believe most of us as young researchers we are having is, is that we come across many instances when we do research that our methodologies that we've developed fail. And as an experienced researcher, what is your approach in troubleshooting such instances? Um, one of the things, um, if you want to develop new science, um, you, should, you should be prepared to have few failures. A uh, lot of these uh, um, prominent scientists in the world, if you quietly ask them how many of their experiments failed, uh, <laughs> A lot of them would have a huge ego. They won't probably admit that they had failures. I think if somebody says I had no failures, I think he's probably the biggest liar in the world. So many people have maybe 50% of their experiments um, failing. In some cases, even more. Um, what you have to do is to do a lot of background reading. Say, if you want to, if you have an idea, okay, so you need to have a, um, some kind of an inkling of an idea. And, uh, and if you want to kind of um, uh, develop it and make, bring it to the lab first, you have to think about how to prove um, this idea how to, to get the idea to work. You have to design experiments to demonstrate this idea. So before jumping into the lab and getting a few round bottom flasks and conical flask and mixing things, what you have to do is to read a lot of papers published in the, in the same area. I mean, I'm talking not just 10, 20 papers, I'm talking hundreds of papers. 
So these days, um, reading papers is not that difficult compared to the time I started doing research. We used to go and photocopy the articles and bring home and read it. Now you can read it. If you have subscription to journals, you can read it online on your screen. Um, so people have folders on your computer with hundreds of PDFs. Um, the time I wrote my thesis, I had a, a, a huge bundle of photocopied papers to read before I wrote the thesis. So important thing is to read as much as possible. And then look for something similar other people have done and the kind of experiments they did uh, to prove it or disprove it. And then start from there. So you pick up a couple of experiments that you can do and then, then do them. So you need to have a, you need to have a, um, um, a plan, plan of experiment. So one, two, three, four, five, these are the things I'm going to do, okay? Um, and then you can um, um, do, the, do the, let's say the first experiment and look at the results and learn something from it. It may fail. One of the most important attribute a scientist should have is to be able to deal with failures, okay? It's easy to deal with the success story, okay? You get a lot of satisfaction. You have, um, you know, your, you have enthusiasm to do more, more work. But the most difficult part is if you have failures. Um, it, it happens to all of us. And also when a student comes to you saying uh, the, the experiment didn't work, uh, you have to sit with that student and explain and try to figure out why it didn't work and what modifications you can do to get it to work. So do a lot of analytical thinking. But the important factor is that you should be able to take a punch, you know? Um, and some people get so discouraged and they think, ah, this is not for me. So you can't give up. So the next question, it's over to you, Sachin. So it connects with the previous question, Isivara. So as you know, sir, we are also in progress with our own undergraduate research. And seeing your extra extravagant portfolio is truly inspirational, if not a little intimidating. Uh, so what advice do you have for undergraduates like ourselves who are just starting off? Yeah, I, I think I can more or less repeat what I said. Um, First and foremost, I think you should read a lot of um, uh, chemistry journals. Um, unfortunately, there are, there are advantages and disadvantages now compared to the time I started doing research. A lot of information is now available to you. You can download the paper into your mobile and read it. Uh, while you are traveling in a car or a bus or a train, you know, um, you can have a, a laptop and then download papers and read it. Um, it is in some ways, the technology has made things easier for you. But in another way, there are so many journals. Um, these days, there are hundreds of chemistry journals. So it's impossible to read all of them. What I would suggest is there are some really iconic chemistry journals like Journal of the Chemical, uh, American Chemical Society, we call it JAX. Um, then the chemical communications coming from Royal Society of Chemistry London. Um, and then all the Royal Society of Chemistry um, uh, journals and then also American Chemical Society Journal. Like for instance, if you are doing physical chemistry, um, uh, you know, a journal like JAX covers everything from physical chemistry to biology. 
okay? So two extremes, medicinal chemistry, uh, hardcore physical chemistry, everything is covered. Um, and it's written very well. I think they are very particular about how you write papers. And even a, when the paper is accepted and they ask you to make so many modifications because their ethos is that if you are, a, let's say a physical scientist and let's say a medic sees your paper in JAX and that person also should take something out of what you have done. So you have to make sure that you write it in such a way it, uh, um, it's, uh, it, it appeals to a um, lot, of, lot of scientists, physicists, medics, everyone, okay? So um, reading and keeping a record of um, uh, what is being done in the field you are going to work. Let's say you broadly, if you pick organic chemistry as your main section of chemistry uh, that you want to pursue a research career, you should read at least the organic chemistry journals and what is being done. And if you have a, um, if you let's say work with somebody um, on a research project and it, um, it gives you inspiration and you should read then more and more about that line of research. Organic chemistry has many, many different angles. So um, these days, um, the, um, most popular areas to do research is energy research. Energy research can come from many different directions, you know, um, it's your alternative forms of energy, um, not burning fossil fuels, um, uh, to, to, to harness the energy freely given out by the sun. So solar energy, all these things are becoming very popular now because of the, it's, it's obvious because the world needs uh, that energy demand in the world has, has, has gone through the roof, you know? So uh, that's one area. And then obviously because of the pandemic, you also see, um, uh, you know, COVID um, people were forced to develop something very quickly like vaccines and so on. So vaccine research, but there is a lot of chemistry. There is a lot of biochemistry involved in, in vaccine research. And then also um, your, your tests, your lateral flow tests, PCR tests, you know, the basis of those tests is chemistry. Chemistry is a central science. So, so you have to pick an area and then you read. And you keep notes in, if, if you read 100 papers, uh, 10, let's say 10 papers caught your eye and inspired you more. So you take, keep notes of what's being done. You know, I would, I would have a folder um, uh, with different classes of papers in it. Um, and then think about what you can do different. So you have to think about something new, learning from what has been done before. If you don't know what has been done before, you know, it's like inventing the wheel again. You may do something today in the lab and find somebody else has done it 20 years ago, you know? So that is one of the most difficult things to do, to know what is new and what is not new. Thank you, yes, sir. I think yeah. like uh, that was a really, really insightful thing to for all the listeners here. And with that, uh, we conclude our insightful session with Dr. Nimal Gunaratna. So thank you very much for your time. And it was an immense privilege and honor to interview you as undergraduates in chemistry and also as Sri Lankans. Uh, we are truly inspired with your groundbreaking research in your expertise. And we hope that everyone who listening with us is inspired too. Thank you very much for having me. And it was a pleasure to talk to you all. And I hope um, uh, 
uh, if you choose uh, to pursue your career in research, um, I hope you have every success in future. Thank, Thank you, you so much, much sir. sir. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. With that, be sure to stay posted on more interviews with eminent scientists in the future with the media circle of College of Chemical Sciences. Thank you.